Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to Reddit Aliens. I am John, as always. Thank you so much for being here. A good topic? Let's do it. For those of you who spend long time out at sea, what's the creepiest or eeriest thing you've seen while underway? Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. A dead body floating in the water. The crew got it into a stretcher, double-bagged it, kept it in the freezer, and turned it over to local authorities at the next port visit. I had a role in that. It was in an advanced state of decomposition, but there was enough remaining to get an identification by dental records. Some family got closure. We were cruising in the Bahamas one night in the Devil's Triangle. All of a sudden, we hear this chain dragging down the hull for like a minute, just scraping. It was unnerving and it was in Exuma Sound, which is like thousands of feet deep, which means it would have been floating and hanging off the bottom of something like an old mine drifting for years. We came about to try and find it, but we could never find it again, just disappeared. Another time we were under the polar ice cap, and the ice sheet moans all the time, like what you think a mermaid siren would sound like, and sometimes you can hear it through the hull for about 65 days straight, non-stop. The North Pole is absolutely the quietest place you can ever be, and in November, it has this fog that's always there. You can't tell how far anything is away. It gets very unnerving after a while. We responded to a sailboat that was taking on water. It became clear that the sailboat wasn't going to make it. We brought the crew on the sailboat onto our vessel, and then we sort of waited around and watched the sailboat sink. What struck me is how silent it was. No fuss, no drama. It wasn't like a dark and stormy night or anything. It was a picture-perfect day. Glassy ocean with not a cloud in the sky. And it didn't matter. It was the kind of day that most seafarers dream about. And yet these guys had been in a fight for their lives trying to keep their boat afloat. After it sank, there were a few bubbles and, and that was it. You'd have never known there was ever a sailboat there. Just a beautiful day without a trace of struggle. Sailboat? What sailboat? Around here? I didn't see a sailboat. I was on a night dive. It was a dive site I was familiar with, and as common in practice, the captain had fixed a steady strobe light to the anchor line of the boat so we could find our way back. As I was readying to complete my dive and descend, I wondered why the strobe was no longer blinking, and I was just a steady beam. Look at my compass, I was doubly confused by how I had gotten my navigation so wrong. I felt foolish. Had I been cocky and overexcited because I was comfortable with the sight? How could I have miscalculated my direction so? It's a dangerous mistake at any time for a diver, much more so at night. But as I was ascending, the brightness of the light really irked me. Why would the captain change the strobe on us? Was something wrong? Then it hit me. I wasn't swimming toward the boat at all. I was swimming toward the moon. The water was so clear and calm I had mistaken it for a light. Luckily, I hadn't ascended fully and wasn't too far off, and I was able to redirect my original navigation, eventually finding the strobe, the boat, and a renewed respect for the ocean's ability to make you second to guess yourself. I saw something that appeared very serpentine and very huge, undulating in the waves of our wake on a very dark, cloudy night en route from Florida to New York City. It was glowing faintly green just underneath the surface, and appeared to be some sort of huge fat snake swimming alongside us with a one and a half foot diameter body. It was mesmerizing, trying to rationalize what I was looking at. Later I realized it was just a dolphin playing in our wake, whose undulating body and wake were lit up by bioluminescent plankton. Another ship that was miles away looked like you could reach out and touch it. It's an optical phenomenon I've seen many times to varying degrees, School of thousands of hammerhead sharks all swimming in the same direction, while whales swimming along that were half eaten, being in storms where seas were tall and thinking back on wooden ships in the past traversing through such storms always weirded me out a bit. Research vessel in the early 90s, about 200 miles off of South Carolina. We could hold position within a few dozen meters using a satellite system, predate GPS, so we stayed parked for days at a time. Sargasso seaweed would drift past us on its way to Europe. One time the bridge called out an oil slick that turned out to be a pod of killer whales drifting past, about to pass half a mile or so off the port side. 
Before the slick came alongside, two whales came over and patrolled stem to stern, maybe thirty feet off the port rail, while the rest of the pod stayed with their kill. About when the kill was even with us, two more whales came and patrolled with the first two, taking two complete laps altogether. Then the first two left to rejoin the lunch party, while the new squad stayed with us. After a while, those two left and we never saw any of them again. At no time did they go to the starboard side, and they never went far beyond the ends of our ship. It was an organized guard patrol. Their message was very clear, and no one denied that we had been warned off. We never did figure out what was on the menu, but it was large enough to form a huge oil slick. Neither terribly eerie nor technically at sea, but I was involved as a crew sailing from Chicago to Mackinac Island in Lake Michigan. This is big enough that you can't see land if you're in the middle. It's a fresh water sea in some sense. The boat was, shall we say, not well maintained, so our lights were out and the GPS had packed it in, though there was a handheld if we needed it. The compass was also way off, so I had the guy with the GPS read our track off until I was set for where we needed to be, looked up and spotted the North Star, Polaris, and a uh, point in the rigging, and just kept it there all night. I told the next watch to just sleep in since I was in the groove and it was magic. We sailed a perfect course until dawn. DL, DR, sailed a good course by the stars all night. A magical experience. I was working in a pearl boat for about 18 months in the Arafura Sea a few years ago, and one of my roles was keeping watch in the wheelhouse. Essentially, you make sure the boat is following a preset path in the navigation, and if it strays, you turn it manually to keep it within the course set. My watch was 4 to 8 a.m. About 7 a.m. I noticed a white cube, perhaps 200 meters port side. Hard to say with no point of reference, but it didn't show up on the nav or radar system. We had that let you plot or recognize boats. It was also not bobbing up and down with the waves. It was just sitting there on the waterline in the distance. I got a better look at it with the binoculars, and it was so strange seeing this white cube just sit still there on the sea in the distance. It wasn't really hovering above it, but as the waves moved with the ocean every now and again, I could see the bottom of it, which is how I know it was a cube. Again, it's hard to say without a point of reference at sea, but I'm guessing it was the size of a van. I'm purely going off of how big things appear in the binoculars when looking at things. I do know how big they are. The person who was following my shift came to drop me a coffee and he saw it too, so it wasn't just me being tired. Following this a few years later, I saw when the Tic Tac videos came out from the Pentagon and some of the fighter pilots said they saw five shaped object floating in the sky. Submariner here. I was a sonar technician, and we were out on mission and had the tow to raise out. We were deep and picked up a couple of bios like shrimp and whales. It was quiet for like 20 minutes after we passed them. All of a sudden, we hear a screeching noise like metal on metal. We thought we ran into another sub. The whole boat went to battle stations and woke up our SME riders to determine what that was. This went on for like five minutes, just in and out. It sounded like a song when you started to replay it. The whole thing was recorded. The acting couldn't determine what it was, nor did the sonar chief. A message was sent out when we went to PD, and the recording was sent to our squadron and ONI once we pulled it. Do not know what happened afterwards, but apparently the Navy collects these type of recordings regularly. From what we can tell, it was close and almost as big as the boat. I couldn't tell if it was bio or another boat. No screw noises or gestation of water and no, we didn't hit anything. I never spent long stretches at sea, but when I was a teenager in the early 80s, I hired on as crew on a trolling boat. I still remember the absolute awe and bit of terror the first time we went into ocean waters. It wasn't stormy or even bad weather, but just the groundswell was enormous enough that when you were at the bottom, you couldn't see the other boats or land, just giant walls of water on either side of you. Incredibly humbling. For a little bit of time while I was in the US military and the Marines, I was stationed on an aircraft carrier for, they had a Mardet, they don't have it anymore, but. I was on the USS Nimitz and we crossed the Atlantic in about 14 days, uh, which in a 91,000 ton ship carrying like 85 planes, it's pretty impressive. And the waves are un 
believable. So, it is humbling. My dad's story. He was an engineer on merchant ships. This happened one night in the 1960s. He was sailing with a Chinese crew. They'd like to put the ship's arc light on and go night fishing. One night, he heard them making a commotion on deck and went to look. Just at the edge of the light was a long, rippling thing about 50 feet long. It moved for several minutes, then just disappeared. The crew were very excited by it. I now suspect it was an oar fish, but we'll never know for certain. My father was a lobsterman. I spent a lot of time on the boat with him throughout my childhood and teens. When I was about 10, I recall fishing for bait, using lines with multiple lures thrown over the side and hauled back up. When the sea was clear and calm, you'd see the fish on the line as you brought it in, flashes of silver in the blue. Occasionally, there'd be a big dark shape, and one of your fish wouldn't be there after. This didn't worry me until the day this happened at the waterline and I watched a 10-foot blue shark turn side on and stare me right in the eye as it stole a mackerel off the hook. The image has never left me. I watched Jaws at too early an age, I think. We were around some islands in the South Pacific. Saw a guy, one lone dude, floating in the middle of the water on some kind of inner tube or life ring. He held us and asked us to stop and bring him aboard because he'd been shipwrecked. Our captain, having not been born yesterday, offered to throw him a rope instead. We'll happily tow you over to the open water and then welcome you aboard. The guy scowled and just said, never mind then. Don't stop around islands and pirated waters, folks. Rogue wave out of nowhere. On a 35-foot boat with a tuna tower, look up and just see a wall of water came crashing down. So much water I thought the boat had capsized and I was underwater beneath the metal of the tuna tower. The pressure broke all the windows, then nothing. Back to a normal day. Was out at sea on an AOR, Auxiliary Oil Replenishment, basically a merchant ship that supplies fuel and supplies to Navy ships. We were out in December in the North Atlantic. We were plowing into a swell large enough that the spray from the bow was hitting the windows on the bridge. The bridge is six decks up and 400 feet aft of the bow. Anyhow, we're pounding through it. You can hear the whole 27,000 ton ship groaning and shuddering every time we hit a swell. Then, the watertight door alarm goes off for the door that leads from the cargo section out onto deck. Taking water into a dry cargo well through the hatch would have been very, very bad. In the end, thankfully, the alarm was... About halfway between Hawaii and California, we, the bridge team on a U.S. Navy ship, saw a stationary, perfectly straight line almost 20 miles long on the surface search radar. At first, we thought it was a radar system issue. As we approached, we didn't see anything unusual. Clear day. No other vessel in sight. Only when approached within a few hundred yards could we see choppy water with a one to two foot chaotic wave and perfectly straight line about 20 yards across with a distinct border separating it from otherwise calm, almost glassy sea. The line extended in both directions as far as we could see. The straightness was what was most eerie to us. We measured the ocean surface temperature outside the zone and it was a noted two degree Fahrenheit difference. The cold water was colder. We passed through the zone without incident. I am was a submariner. We got some new escape suits aboard and were running familiarization exercises while underway. The exercise involved opening the lower of the two escape hatches in the engine room and going into the escape trunk. It was wild to just look at the single upper hatch, knowing what was on the other side waiting to kill us if we effed up. If that wasn't enough, I was sleeping in my rack some time after and had a dream about being in the escape trunk when someone closed and locked me in the trunk and the upper hatch was about to open. I started punching the lower hatch yelling, let me out. When I woke up, the dude in the rack above me asked if I was okay because I was punching the bejesus out of the ceiling in my rack. Other than that, doing any amount of time at test depth, sometimes the only way to tell if a repair was successful was to go deep. Not me, but my grandfather. He was one of the first Americans to fight in World War I all the way back in early 1915. The U.S. didn't officially get involved until late 1917 and didn't arrive in force until 1918. Well, seeing as the U.S. was not officially involved in World War I yet, he walked about 50 miles from his cabin in eastern Kentucky, which was only recently demolished and only because junkies were squatting in it, 
to catch a series of buses from Lexington, Kentucky to New York City, where he booked passage on an ocean liner to London. Well, during the voyage across the Atlantic, he saw some rather odd shit. Between odd lights and a storm, finding a mermaid in the water, which actually turned out to be the remains of some poor sailor who had gotten thrown overboard in a storm, if he was ever identified, I do not know his name, and anyone on his ship is now almost certainly dead, getting torpedoed by the Germans. Thankfully, only one barely hit the ship, and it didn't fully explode, so only a handful of people were wounded and none killed. Then, there were multiple reports of ghost sightings, well cut ahead to when he's a much smaller vessel crossing the English Channel, when they spot what they thought was a German submarine, but upon closer inspection, turned out to be a capsized boat with the remains of some sailors, which were so badly decomposed that they were better described as human stew than a human body. I had friends who were stationed in Guam who all had stories. One of them was a friend who lived up high in some apartments that overlooked the harbor that was famous for deep sea fishing tours. One day he saw a small boat that had a big catch, probably a 10 to 15 foot great white shark that didn't fit on the boat, so they were trailing it. While he was watching from his balcony, he saw a school of fish behind the carcass, which wasn't that unusual, but the school of fish moved different. He said it looked more like some kind of large tadpole. It kept darting toward the carcass and then swimming away, which is also school behavior. He thought, the angle must be funny, but then the tadpole swam up to the shark and suddenly the shark disappeared under the water. The boat that was trailing it stalled like it dropped anchor from the aft and struggled before suddenly bobbing forward. Only the shark's head was left. They pulled it up, circled the area, and then left. Whatever got away with 80% of the carcass must have had a mouth at least 10 feet wide. He had heard of this, but never saw it himself. Nobody was surprised when he retold the story. Another friend had a more light-hearted story. Diving in Guam, there's a lot of bomb craters in the shallows. Barracuda hunt as a pack when young, but as adults are solitary and territorial. One popular diving site had Bob the Barracuda, who guarded those craters. Now, Barracuda aren't dumb. They know you're spearfishing, which means easy food. They are apparently actually inquisitive and fairly intelligent like mores, but look like six-foot silver torpedoes with terrifying teeth. People would bribe Bob like with hot dogs. The local bait shop had eight packs of Franks, and you'd bring one with you because Bob and other sea life sure loved hot dogs. Bob was also very stealthy. You wouldn't see him until he was right at your face mask. He expected hot dogs. My friend said one day he was out looking for fish, and Bob appeared out of nowhere, as his was worth to do, but highly focused on his groin. I had forgotten that I'd had my hot dogs in my neat bag between my legs. Let me tell you, I really moved slowly and carefully to get Bob his hot dogs, because I wanted no misunderstanding. 